Uh, if you want to flip open your copy of God's Word, if you have it, as you get there to Hebrews 10, we'll be there at, just briefly at the very end, but it is a very important passage. Hebrews chapter 10 is where we are in, uh, in our Word. And so, one thing I wanted to talk about today is, again, what we've been talking about the past couple weeks. We've been talking about rediscovering church, rediscovering the idea, the essential nature of the body of Christ. We've talked about a few things. The, the questions we've answered is, what is church? And we've answered the question, who can belong? We've answered the, the question, what is church, in a very simple way. The, the answer that we will give and we will always know as long as we go is simple. That the church is a people and a family belonging to God, bound together in Christ as the body of Christ, empowered by the Spirit to be the hands and feet of Christ to all people. Now, again, I want to ask the quick question. Can you actually read these today? Okay, I made it ultra white, dark black background, and I made it a square. So say this with me. The church is a people and family belonging to God bound together in Christ as the body of Christ, empowered by the Spirit to be the hands and feet of Christ to all people. That's what the church is. And we at First Baptist Sinton, what we exist to do as that church, what we exist to do is this, say this with me, to make disciples, to gather together, and to display His glory. I want us to know that. I want us to believe that. I want us to know and see the mission. And so what is church is that few things. We are a people. We are uh, belonging to God, bound together in Christ as the body of Christ, empowered by the Spirit to be the hands and feet uh, to all people, of Christ to all people. And we exist to make disciples, to gather together, to display His glory. We talked about who can belong to a church. And the very simple answer is baptized believers. If you aren't a believer, you can't be a part of the church because you don't know Jesus. And if you don't know Jesus, you don't know the head, and you can't be a part of the body if you don't know the head. If you've never been baptized, the truth is you've never made that confession. You've made that, never made that understanding. You can be saved and not be baptized, I believe, wholeheartedly. But why would you want to not be baptized if, and, 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 and in the church and a part of the church? Because that identifies us as part of the church. And this is very important. So what do we see? We see who can belong, what is church, and we see all of these things. But the question today we're going to answer is, why do we gather? We've seen what it is. We know who can belong. But now the question is, why is it that baptized believers get together every Sunday morning? Why is it baptized believers get together on Sunday nights? Why is baptized believers get together on a random uh, Wednesday night every single week? Or, or, or maybe a game night for ladies game night or for a fellowship meal? Why do baptized believers gather? Well, see... The first thing I want us to know is the very word itself. We, we learned this. You guys are Greek scholars from two weeks ago. You're Greek scholars. And, and say this with me. The first word, it's ekklesia. Say it. Ekklesia. Let's say it. One, two, three. You're Greek scholars. You're smart cookies. Okay, this is the thing. You have gone through seminary training just right there. Ekklesia, quite literally, it means to gather or the gathering. In the church, under, uh, the, in the understanding of the New Testament, the, what it actually means is the gathering of people who find their identity and their mission in Christ. In fact, as a baptized believer, you believe in Jesus. You find everything in Christ. You are baptized into Christ. You are, all of these things are about Christ. And the ecclesia, the church, is not just some random gathering or a political gathering. Or a gathering because we all just like peanuts and pralines. This is a gathering of people who find our identity and our mission in Christ Jesus. In fact, the other word you could say is that the church is a community. The church is communal. We find something in common. We find common ground. We find something that unites us. Because if, if I were to, you know, just look at all of us and I was to survey all of us, we would all have different jobs or different interests. And we all have different hair colors and different fa fancy things in our house. We have different furniture. We have all sorts of different desires for a car. Some of us love Fords. Some of us love Chevys. Some of us love the cheapest thing we can drive because we don't want to pay money for a car payment. I mean, whatever it is, we all have differences of opinion. We all are different. God has designed us that way. Some of us are loud. Some of us are not so much loud. 
Some of us are boisterous. We're very strong-headed and strong-willed. And some of us are very timid and, and mild. And we like to take a step back and watch. Some of us are just mean. And some of us are just, no, no, I don't think anybody's just mean. But the truth is, is we, in Christ Jesus, find commonality. We are community. In fact, the church, if it is not a community, it's just a bunch of people that happen to gather. But that's the thing is, as saved, baptized believers, again, we've said that you can be a believer and not be a part of the body of Christ. You can be a believer and not be a part of a a local church. But then you miss the whole aspect of our mission. You miss the whole aspect of our identity. Because if you are an individual, if you are alone, if you are, if you are a, away from the church, you miss a key part of who you actually are meant to be. In Jesus Christ, he has made you a new creation. He has made you new and whole. He has given you an identity, a purpose. He's given you every reason to live. And if you miss this, you miss the truth. If you miss the, the reason why uh, you are a believer, it's to gather. It's to get together. It's to worship together. It's to be a people not just a person. In fact, this is the grand idea, is that what we're going to look at first is why do we gather? We gather because it is our identity. You see, we are not just, uh, when we look at things in our life that understand this, the, the, the community that we see, even just externally, is that a team is not just one player. You can put that up there. A team is not just one player. A body is not just one finger. And therefore, a church is not just one believer. And this is what I want to make central. I mean, imagine going out there on, uh, to a football sentin game, you know, a sentin football game. You're reared up, you're excited, you're pumped up, you've seen all the people, you have your tickets, you have everything ready, you have your snacks if you pack them because you have a three-year-old and he likes to eat, and you're up there in the stands and you're excited, and what do you see walking out? You see the coach, and he's just strutting out, and he's doing his thing. He comes running out of that tunnel because we all love to see that. And you see all the, other, all the other coaches run, and then guess what? You see one person, you see the quarterback running out. And that's it. And he gets out on that field, and that quarterback says, let's go. And he starts throwing it. Who does he throw to? What, who blocks for him? Who, who protects him from the other team? The other team's fully stocked, but it's just him against the world. How well do you think that game is going to go? Very poorly. Why? Because a player doesn't make a team. A player is just one person. In the same way that a, a finger, if you were to find a finger, which hopefully you never find a finger, but if you were to find a finger, and you would not go, oh, yes, that's a full body right there. Why? Because it's just a part. This is key. We all understand this. This is basic understanding. But sometimes I think we forget that one church member, one person, it, it is not the full church. What I mean by this is simple. That the believer's identity... <laughs> That a believer's identity is that they are a member of the family of God. They are a member of the body of Christ. They are a member of the very temple and house of God. They are one stone in a full building. You see, it's hard to be the house of God. It's hard to be the temple of God and just be a stone that's separated from everyone else. If I saw a brick separated, I wouldn't go, Oh, yes, that is made for First Baptist Sinton building the building. I would look at it and go, that's a brick. It has the potential to be a part of a building. But until it is joined with it, until it is together, until it is gathered amongst the the other bricks, it will not make the building. In fact, this is the truth. That the church is not a person or a building, but it is a gathering of God's people. And you cannot miss this. You as an individual believer, you are a part of the church, but you are not the church individually. Meaning, if you go out and you're saying, hey, I can feel God, I can go to church out there in in the middle of nowhere on my bass boat, and I can go to a nice Corpus Christi lake or whatever lake you choose to go to, I don't even know if that's what it's called, but or you choose to go out in the middle of the ocean on your boat. And I've heard this countless times. I can go to church out there on the water. No. You're going to maybe worship. You're going to worship God alone out there. You're going to maybe get away but you're not going to church because you're not gathering with anyone else. In fact, the most overquoted verse sometimes in Matthew 18 is where two or three are gathered, that's where the Lord will be. That's about church discipline. We'll talk about it. But that verse gives us the idea that, yes, there is, a, there is something about church. And it, there is something about gathering. And there is something about numbers. It doesn't matter how many people you have. 
there's nowhere in the Bible that it says we have to have 150 members to be a complete church. It gives us two or three. But where a gathering, a, a few baptized believers are together, they are a part of a church. They are a part, if they, again, we'll talk about it, if they perform the ordinances, if they baptize, if they do all the things that the church should do. But their identity is the key. So why do we gather? We gather because it, it literally is our identity as a believer. You see, the identity is not that we are one person dwelling to alone. We are one person who dwells amongst fellow other believers. We are one member of a giant thing. In fact, one of the verses that we see, Ephesians 4, 4 through 6 says, For there is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope at your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all in all. That verse shows us one very simple thing, that it's about being one. One with who? One with Christ and one with one another. In fact, the whole scriptures point to the fact that if you were trying to do your faith, if you're trying to be a Christian alone, you're not going to get very far. That in, very, in the very beginning in Acts, it was 12 people who, who were actually 120 people gathered who became larger and larger and larger. And the fact that the early parts of Acts, it says that they all had one thing in common. They all shared stuff. They shared their life together. They shared their bread together. They shared their friends together. They shared their belief together, their religion together. They shared it all. And what this verse shows us is that we share one Lord. We share one spirit. We share one body. We share one baptism. There is nothing, the only thing that, that is different about us is who we are individually. But the one thing that unites us, the one thing that calls us together is our oneness in Jesus. Does this make sense? Following what I'm tracking. You see, we gather because it is our identity. We are the body of Christ. We are believers who have been baptized into Christ. If you are a believer and you've never joined a church, you've never been a part of a church, you're missing out on your identity. You are not just a random human being. You're not just a random believer. You are a believer intended to be a part of something greater than yourself. And that's not just me boistering you up saying there's a purpose beyond you. It's me simply saying the gospel shows us that we have a purpose and that purpose is is better done together than it is done alone. We don't need to be John the Baptist isolating ourselves because Jesus has come in order to bring us together, bring us with him. And sometimes, yes, there are missionaries who go off. But guess what? They're not alone. Uh, in fact, I love this. When I went to Egypt, we went out there with missionaries. Missionaries who were wonderful people. They were awesome. They had a mission. They had the way that they were in the country and the way that they were able to exist. And, and I'll tell you those details because you know, I won't tell you those details because I don't really want to tell you who they were because we're recording. And so the idea is they are in a very hostile environment, hostile country. But one thing I love is while they were maybe together just two or three families, they weren't alone. Why? Because they were sent by another church. In the same way, Ann and Terry, we're going to send them to Carrizo Springs. They're, no, they're not going to be alone. Why? Because we are faithfully praying for them. We're faithfully caring for them. We're faithfully saying, God, would you do something mighty in their life? They have a support system, even though they're going away. And they're going to hopefully join another support system. Why? Because that's what believers do. We don't isolate ourselves. We join together. It's our identity. It's what Jesus did. He, 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 he died so that we might be saved, so that we might be saved, so that we might be able to join the family of God, so that we may be able to join the body of Christ, so that we might be able to join the temple and be a part of the building of the temple of God. We tracking him? We watch Aaron? We, we're there? You see, why do we gather? We gather because it's our identity. But secondly, it's our mission. Not only is it who we are, but it's what we're called to do. In fact, our mission from our own First Baptist Sinton mission, from Scripture, from all over the things, these three things we can clearly see in Scripture. That our mission is that we are to make Christ known. It is hard to make Christ known alone. But it is very easy to make Christ known when we dwell amongst one another. We are to make disciples of Christ. Not just are not just be alone, but to go out and actually share Christ so that we can bring them in. 
That's what church is all about. Not just getting a bunch of people in here, but to go out, share Christ, bring them into this whole thing, love them, care for them, make them known, and, and make them aware that Christ loves them and cares for them, and He has a purpose for their life, and He has a mission for them. Like It is to bring people into something that we have. Not bring them in, let them sit and say, all right, I'm going back out. You guys stay here. It's to bring them into, it's to draw them in, to show them how to do the very thing that we've been called to do as disciples. And part of our mission is to make Christ known, to make disciples of Christ, but to maintain the love of Christ with one another. Again, that whole thing is, as we make disciples, we don't just leave them and say, you have a pew now, you're welcome. It's to say, you have a pew and you have a family and you have friends and you have a home and you have people that love you, love you so dearly and we're going to care for you and we're going to talk about the, the, the one another's in a second, but we're going to pour out our lives for you. We're going to sacrifice whatever it is that we need to sacrifice for your sake. We're going to be here for you because we know that you as a baptized believer are here for us. That's the beauty of it. And sometimes I think we, we as a church, we focus so much on the visitor and we forget that the visitor is... is it's central, it's a care, it's a focus, but sometimes I think churches get it backwards. They focus so much on their visitor that they, they forget the people that sit in the pews. It's in the same way we celebrate people in the church. We celebrate the victories. We celebrate the goodness. We celebrate what God has done. And we do these things because church is not about just a bunch of random people getting together. It's who we are. It's people that love Jesus, that love one another, that care for one another. Our mission... Our identity is in Christ. Our identity is to be the gathering of Christ. And our mission is to make Christ known, to make disciples of Christ, and to maintain the love of Christ with one another. Let me read some verses for you just that make sense. I love this, John 17, 23. And this is from the NLT just because I really love the wordage on this. It says, I am in them and you are in me. May they experience such perfect unity that the world will know that you sent me and that you love them as much as you love them. I love me. Jesus in his prayer for you, if you were to read a few verses up, Jesus is praying not just for his disciples. He says, and those who would hear from the disciples about me. He's praying for you. You sitting in 2022 in this pew, he's praying for you. That you have heard the gospel because someone has shared the gospel with you. Or maybe for the first time you're hearing the gospel, you're going to hear the gospel today, and, and, and you've heard it because someone cared about you enough to share it with you. You're going to sit with people who know the gospel and are going to live out the gospel with you, at, hopefully at, right now and hopefully at the celebration at, at our fellowship meal. And they're going to do that because they love Jesus and they love you. You see, what this verse says is that Jesus who prayed for you, he, this is one of his prayers. That we would not just be individuals who go off on mission alone. That we would be people who have such perfect unity, perfect oneness, perfect love, perfect care, perfect grace. That we would, one, with one another, be united so much so that the world can't help but notice. There is something about a church that loves each other. Not a church that, that just happy sunshine rainbow all the time, but a church that in problems and frustrations and hard times, they truly love the people sitting across the pew from them. They love them. They care for them. Even when there's drama and frustrations, there's still this unique love that comes only from Christ. And only because of him, but only because of the love he shared for individual believers and for his body is the same love that they have for one another because Christ died for them. They give everything for one another. And this is what Jesus says, that when, if we have perfect unity, the world will know. He prays that the world will know that not that the church is awesome, not that the church has no problems, but that the church points to Jesus. Do people walk into First Baptist sin? And see the love that we have for one another. And do they know who Jesus is because of it? Do they know that there's something about this Jesus that we worship? Do they know by the love that we have for one another, there's something about the message that we preach, the, the, the gospel that we teach, the, 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 the Sunday school lessons that we pour ourselves over, the, the word of God that we bring every single week. Do they know something's up because of the unity that we share? It's hard to know that Jesus loved his body. It's hard to know that Jesus died for the, all his, of his church when it's just you and you alone against the world. What Jesus says is the key is that we would have perfect unity. In order to make Christ known, we would be united together. In fact, another verse is the key mission, to make disciples of Christ. Why do we gather? We gather because 
We are called and commanded to go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. Notice who Jesus says this to. He says it both to individuals, but he says it to the church. Go and be the church. Go and baptize people. Go and teach people about me. Go and know that I am with you always. Jesus says this to his disciples. He says this to those who are gathering. Those who are gathered and watching him ascend. He's saying it to people, not to a person. That's unique. He doesn't bring Peter up to the mountain and says, let me give you everything. He brings Peter, James, John, and all the rest and says, let me show you who you are. And let me show you the mission that you have. John 13, 34 through 35 says this. I give you a new command. Love one another. Say love one another if you're here. Just as I have loved you. You are, also, you are also to love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. I mean, love one another is literally that whole entire verse. You could just summarize it with those three words. Love one another. Why is it that sometimes the church forgets that love one another is part of the mission? It's not about just loving the unbeliever or loving the world or loving the sinner. It's about loving the sinners who have become saints. It's about loving one another because they, are the e they should be the easiest people to love. Because they share a commonality with us. They share the scriptures with us. They share the word with us. They share the baptism with us. They share our Lord. They share our Savior. They share the mercy of God with us. They share all of these things in common. They should be the first people we love. But oftentimes we neglect that. And what Jesus says is it's a key part, a key tenet of the faith. That if you were to say, I am a Christian, uh, this is an easy litmus test. If you want to know a, a believer, if you want to know how well they love Jesus, look how well they love their church. If you want to know how well a believer loves Jesus, look how well they love their church, their church family, their local gathering, the people they join together with, the people that they have said, I am a part of you, I am with you. Look how well they love them and you will know their love for Jesus. Our mission is to make Christ known. It's to make disciples of Christ. It's to maintain the love of Christ with one another. I also love this verse. In the verse in Hebrews that we're going to read, it says this. And this is just a precursor, and we're going to focus on two verses at the end. But this says this, And since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed in pure water. Let us hold on to the confession of our hope without wavering, since he who promised is faithful. And let us consider one another in order to provoke love and good works, not neglecting to gather together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging each other, and all the more as you see the day approaching. I love these verses because it's following that we are a part of the house of God. And since Jesus is now the high priest of this house, the, the church, He's the, the guy who's in charge. He's the guy who connects us to God the Father. He's the one who gives us access and prayer in all sorts of ways. That we are not just isolated people that are longing for God's presence. We are people that God dwells within us through his spirit. And what this verse tells us is that there's a few things we need to do. The few things that we gather to do, that we are together, that we as the church of God should be doing. Again, the same thing we just said, it's just said, summarized in three different ways in these verses. It says this, that the mission is that we, number one, draw near to God. That we have, together, we draw near to Him. We don't just say, I'm, I have access to God on my own. We say, notice who he's talking to. Paul, who's writing Hebrews, or whoever you believe writes Hebrews, says this. That together, as the house of God, what we do is we draw near to God. We also, he says, let us hold fast to our confession. Not holding fast to the confession alone, but holding fast to the confession together. You see, when I have another brother and sister in Christ next to me, and another brother and sister in Christ next to me that have the same confession, Jesus is Lord. Say this, Jesus is Lord. That's the confession we have as believers. If we have that commonality, we can look at one another and say, I know they believe what I believe. I know they are who they are in Christ Jesus. I know they care about what I care about. I know they have the mission that I have. I know that they have the, 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 the desires that I have. Even though they may have different families and different backgrounds, they love Jesus. 
And not only do they love Jesus and they, 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 they hold fast to that confession, but they draw near to God weekly and, and daily. They pray to him. They pray with us. We, we just prayed together over two different families. And that's what we did together. We, draw near, we drew near to the throne and grace and mercy seat of God for him to say, would, would, you, would you just do something that we've asked you to do, not because of who we are, but because how gracious you are? Would you bless these two people? Would you care for them? All of these things. But lastly in that verse, and usually it's the verse that people pound over the head of other people saying, hey, you better go to church. This is not what that verse means. In fact, the mission of that verse, verse 25, 24 and 25 is this, that we consider one another. He says, let us consider one another in order to provoke love, good works. Not neglecting to gather together. He's not telling you, Don't, you, you better gather because, or else you're going to go to hell. He says, you better gather because it's who you are. You better gather because it's part of the mission. You've got to gather because that's, that's what the church is intended to be. That word, let us consider one another. I have a slide that says consider one another. That word, those, those words mean giving careful thought to how we provoke each other towards holiness. That's right. We are accountable to one another. That as you love Jesus, I love Jesus. And as you pursue holiness, I pursue holiness. But sometimes we need a bit of encouragement to say, hey, I see something slipping. I see something going. I, maybe you need to correct that. Hey, I see somewhere in your life where things are faltering. We don't, hold, we don't hold people accountable to bash them over the head. We hold people accountable because we want to see them love Jesus in a greater way. But then we also open our lives to say, hey, you examine my life too as much as I love you. We're not judging people. We're caring for people. That's the difference. We have a heart to care for one another, to uplift one another, to consider what this verse says, how to provoke one another to love and good works. H have you ever provoked something? Uh, have you ever provoked a, a, like a small child? Like, you know, like poke them, you know, like continue to, like I love my kid, but there's sometimes I know how to provoke them. I know how to like go, hey, if I take that toy away from him, he's going to get really mad. He's going to get really upset. I'm just going to take it, and I'm going to let the whole household just be terrible and miserable for the rest of the day because I took a ball away. That happened recently. We went to HEB. I told him, I said, don't hold the golf ball because I don't want you to throw it. I gave him a different toy, and he lost it. And we had the most miserable time in HEB. In fact, the Methodist guy, and one of the Methodist guys walked up, and he was like, you be nice to your dad. And I was like, thank you. I need that. I provoked my child very easily. But we are called to provoke, to point, to poke, to prod, to continue to get into each other's lives so much so that we provoke one another, not to anger and frustration and miserableness, but to love, to loving one another, to loving the world, to loving those who need Jesus, and, and to good works, to doing the things of giving, other, uh, giving our, ourselves to other people, people in need. Notice these passages, and just, just the scriptures, it says one another more times than you know. Just look at these passages. It says to and love one another. It says to show honor to one another, to instruct one another, to serve one another through love. It says to carry one another's burdens, to patiently bear with one another in love, to be kind to one another, to submit to one another in Christ. In another slide, it says humbly consider others as more important than yourself. Don't lie to one another. Encourage one another. Pursue what is good for one another. Watch out for one another. Encourage one another. Don't criticize one another. Say one another. Here's another slide. Don't complain about one another. That's a hard one. Confess your sins to one another. Pray for one another. Be hospitable to one another. Clothe yourself with humility towards one another. All of those verses talk about one simple thing. One another. Say one another. So why would we think that one another don't matter in our life, in our Christian walk? The Bible is very clear. We love one another. I love this quote. I'm almost done, but I love this quote. It says from the book that we were reading, and there's still copies out there. If you Feel free to take one. But this quote says this. Think about it. Maybe you struggle with hidden hatred towards a brother or sister all week, but then his presence at the Lord's table draws you to conviction and confession. You struggle with suspicion towards a sister. But when you see her singing the same songs of praise, your heart warms. You struggle with anxiety over what's happening politically in our nation. But then the preacher declares Christ's coming and victory and vindication. 
sanctification. You hear shouts of amen all around you and recall that you belong to a heavenly citizenry allied in hope. You're tempted to keep your struggle in the dark. But then the older couple, ten, uh, tender but pressing, question you over lunch. How are you really drawing you into the light? We need one another. We love one another because it is who we are as believers. The truth is, why do we gather? Because it's who we are. It's our identity. It's the very mission of Christ to not just get people saved and win them so that they can go to heaven one day, but to to share Christ's love with them and, and bring them in and draw them in so that we might love them continuously and forever and for always in eternity. It's not about loving people for a moment. It's about loving people for eternity. And that's our mission. But loving Christ together. The truth is, why do we gather? Because it's not all about us. It's about one another. 